for one, one, one. Awesome. Good to see your beautiful faces tonight. Um, just a reminder, why are we here? What are we doing here tonight? We are hopefully in gathering together in his name. We're getting encouraged. We're getting inspired. Um, we're getting poured into, having some value uh, spoken into our hearts and our lives tonight through the word of the Lord. You know, this is a uh, a gathering where we are becoming worshipers, which means a whole lot more than just singing songs. It, it's where we begin to understand who God is and who we are. And so as Juan aptly said, uh, we're doing that tonight through this uh, series we're calling The Son of Man. Jesus, as Nathan was singing about, is referred to by so many names, which is awesome. It's powerful to speak those names out and sing those names out. But his favorite name that he called himself was The Son of Man. Isn't that really interesting? It's, there's so many implications to that because what he's trying to do is he's trying to set an example for us as sons and daughters. He was the firstborn of, 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 among many, what does the Bible say, brothers and sisters, right? He was the firstborn. So he's giving an example of who we are actually and what life could look like for us to live as one's who now carry Christ in us, the hope of glory for the entire world. If you believe that, say amen. So it's, it's a really profound, um, powerful concept, and so we're going to dive into that tonight. FYI, you know, as the harbor culturally, throughout the years we've always had worship where we, we come into moments like this to understand who we are by looking at Jesus and sing songs and get encouraged and inspired. But we also have engagement, which means we get to know one another. We start to live and do life together together. And that's so important to lean into those spaces, which there's many of those that will come along and have come along. So, you know, whether it comes to men or women or, you know, gatherings in homes and stuff like that, it's really important to, to, to be known and to be seen, right? Versus just come and sit in a room and look at the back of somebody's head. Can I get an amen? So it's, this is beautiful tonight, but it's, it's part of a, a greater equation, if that makes sense. So, so let's dive in tonight. Um, we last week kicked off uh, Luke chapter 19, uh, verse 10. I'm just going to put this up for you just to remind us of, of, of what we talked about and then, and then kind of go a little deeper in this. I felt like the Lord said, take it a little deeper. These guys can handle it, all right? So, you know, take it a little deeper, and I just pray that God would just speak to our hearts. He's the teacher here ultimately tonight. But remember, Jesus speaking of himself, he said, for the Son of Man, here's a reference to his name that he loved about himself, came to seek and save that which was lost. I love the spirit behind this verse um, that many times we, we may be unfamiliar with or forget. It's so good to be reminded of who Jesus is as he was coming to seek and save that which was lost. I referred to a phrase from a song of one of my favorite writers, one of my favorite singers, Jason Upton, and he says this in his song. I just want to remind you of it. I spoke it last week. He says, many men are brave, speaking of Jesus, and many men are strong, but few have I ever seen, listen to the beauty in this, who fight for who's right and fight for who's wrong, who fight for the friend and the thief. We looked last week at Zacchaeus who was a rich man and he got rich because he was a thief. And yet he was the one that Jesus saw and encountered his life in such a profound way he was instantly transformed and changed. Can you believe that? The power of the love of God to change somebody's life. So let's go a little deeper in this verse and then we're gonna, we're gonna look at one portion of scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter five. How cool would it be to walk away from here tonight and say, man, I understand at least one book in the Bible. How awesome would that be? So I'm not going to read every single verse in chapter 5, but I'm going to give you enough that hopefully it will inspire you to go back and look at yourself and really grow from what is being shown in that, in that chapter through the Apostle Paul. But we first need to just establish kind of where I'm going tonight by going a little deeper in the very verse that I just read to you in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. All right? And this is where you got to get a strongest concordance. It's important to be able to open up sp specific words, go a little deeper in the meaning of that word, because it's really powerful. It's really profound stuff. So verse 10 says, for the Son of Man is come. That's the Greek word, erakomai. I think I said that correctly. It sounds good. If it was wrong, you would never know the difference, right? 
Arachomai. And here's what it means. It means to be set or established. So Jesus, he's not just talking about his physical coming into the earth. He's referring to the process that he's been in for 30 years of knowing the Father, seeing the Father, watching the Father, listening to the Father, and replicating everything that I just described as he's behold this one that is his Father, right? And so over this time, he now, he's saying, is established. Could you imagine if the body of Christ in this moment Amidst all the uncertainty, amidst all the stuff the culture of this world is trying to throw at humanity, would be established in our place in the Lord by just looking at this beautiful one. It's incredible. And this is where Jesus finds himself. And he says, to seek and to save that which was lost. It's really interesting here. The word seek, zeteo, means to worship. Seeking is, is not so much like, let me go um, hunting for souls. Like, I'm going to, you know, put another notch, if you will, on my soul checklist. He's actually saying, man, I'm established in this place with the Lord, and I'm moving into a place of permanence in my worship. You see, we, we've reserved, we, everything it's, for so many years has been this whole sacred and secular concept which is completely anti-biblical. Did you know that? There's no clergy and laity. There's no sacred and secular. It's, 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 it's so much broader than that. And Jesus is saying, listen, I'm in, in my seeking, it's basically I'm just living out worship every moment of the day, 24-7. Which if you look at worship, we talk about this a lot here in our True North Discipleship Framework, which this is our language around kingdom stuff, that is nothing new under the sun. We, we understand that worship is all about intimacy with him. The door has been opened, right? The door can't be shut. We found favor with God through Jesus. And in that intimacy, 24-7, 365, where we don't have to live in the sin-shame sin cycle anymore, we can approach him with total confidence, total boldness, and come before his beautiful throne because of the blood of the Lamb which then begins to establish us in our identity, which Juan was speaking of tonight. Powerful. When you get established in your identity, that's when it's a game changer. Because then you start to manifest your true nature or your true self in Christ and Christ in you. You begin to become who you were always intended to be, the most truest, authentic version of yourself. And so he says, man, I have come. I'm established, I'm set in this place of worship to seek and to save. That's the word to deliver, to protect, to heal, and to preserve. That's pretty good news right there. Can you imagine if we lived in this reality right here that Jesus was walking in, and every single place that we went, we're established, we're set, we're living out worship through intimacy, identity, and integrity. And now all of a sudden, healing, deliverance, protection, and preservation overflows out of our lives into the lives of other people. That's what happened to Zacchaeus in that moment. When Jesus encounters him, this thief that no one else really wanted to go talk to. In fact, when he said, I must come into your home, he's, he's saying, I want to come into your place of residence. It says everybody got upset about this. The religious got upset about this moment. What hypocrisy, right? God is trying to change the way that we think. So here's what I want to look at tonight, just for the few minutes that I have Remaining, um, which I'm not going to tell you how many few minutes that is. It could be long. It could be short. I didn't define it. Come on, somebody. Um, but we're going to look at to the concept that we are ambassadors of Jesus, ambassadors of Christ. It's a beautiful, beautiful concept found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And just to give you a little context, because we're not going to go through the whole chapter, but in the beginning, 1 through 5 verses in, in, in the chapter, Paul talks about, 
the earthly body, which is the tent that, that we, we, we get in privileged to, to, to be placed into, right, in this earth. And it is, it is the, the dwelling place of God, actually. This is profound. Our bodies are the dwelling place of God on the earth. We don't really think about it. That's why it's so important for us to steward these earthly tents because it's the dwelling place of God, you know, in the earth, if you will. He dwells in these bodies that he's given us. But then in this, in this just to just go a little deeper in this concept, he talks in, in chapter 5, verse 5. I'm actually going to put this up for you. He says, God himself has prepared us for this very thing, very thing that he's, he's given to us, this guarantee, um, which is the Holy Spirit. It's like he's put something, he's like, I've got something. Okay, you got your body. It's, it's going to be a dwelling place for you, me. You may not even understand that, but I'm going to start to give you some clues because I'm going to give you my presence, my essence on the inside of your frame as, as a, a down payment, if you will, where you're going to start to awaken to actually who you were always created to be. That's basically what he's kind of going into in verse 5. Why? Why would he give us his presence? Because his presence is the, hear me, is the only spiritual authority in the earth. There's two forms of authority. We need them both. Actually, there's, there's um, spiritual authority and there's natural authority found in, in, in fiscal resources. Okay? And fiscal resources in, embolden us to be able to do some things that we couldn't do without them. Do you understand that? Right? There's, 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 a, there's a natural authority in, in fiscal resource, but then there's a spiritual authority in the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of his people. It's been, it's been given to us. Paul then goes on to say in verse 11 and 12 about our understanding of the authority now because we carry his presence on the inside of us that has been delegated to us. Everybody say delegated. So he's delegated his authority to humanity. I just I need to pause right there because that is an insane concept. Jesus embodied and emboldened the full authority of God in himself, right? While he was on this earth. He's getting ready to ascend, to be seated, and he tells his followers, hey, don't be afraid. It's all good. I'm going to send a helper to be with you so that now the authority of Jesus could be transferred to his followers. We still live in, well, God, we need you to do something when he's like, I am in you and through you. Wake up. This is what, I'm, this is what he's up to. And it's been delegated to us. And, and the only thing that he's, he's asking of us and this is, this is really powerful, and you got to go read it for yourself. Do it with authenticity. Be authentic. Be sincere. Because there's nothing worse than, like, unsincere, unauthentic spirituality, if you will. We've all seen it, right, in the church. You can sniff it out a mile away. It's like, just be real. Be yourself. You know, don't get, don't get programmatic in this thing. Like, just chill out a little bit. Just relax. Just do life, you know. <laughs> and, and, and who you are and who he is will just kind of flow out from you. It's beautiful. Like one was saying, stop striving. Just rest. Be at peace. But for the sake of time, I, need to, I just want to skip ahead. This is crazy. To the very last verse. Because it's so important for you to catch this. Because you're like, what are you talking about? Ambassador, authority. Um, this has been delegated to us. I, just, I need to show it to you in the word. Because otherwise you're going to think, Darren, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? Look at, look at verse 20 of ch chapter 5. He says it clearly. Read this with me. And if you can see it and believe it, I want you to say amen at the end. All right? It says, so we are Christ's. Oh, there it is. Whoa. Darren's not crazy. All right? We are Christ's ambassadors. Now, look at this. God is making his appeal through us. 
So, Darren, what are you saying? God's not just going to show up and just start making his appeal? That's exactly what I'm saying. He's waiting for his church to arise and do it. It's been the assignment that he's had for us since the moment Jesus ascended to heaven. Religion has played another card, and the, and the fruit of that is no transformation in the world. People more in bondage by religion than beforehand, right? And so he's saying, listen, you are my ambassadors. I'm going to make my appeal through you to tell people the good news of the kingdom of God. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. And really, we come back to God because God's come back to us. The, 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 the doorway has been completely opened again through Jesus. There's no separation. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I looked up the word ambassador, and it means envoy. I want to show you this definition. This is really powerful. So it, it ties in. An envoy is a person delegated to represent one government. Okay? There's a government called the kingdom of God. Do you understand that? There's a government called the kingdom of heaven. And an envoy is a person delegated to represent that government in its dealings with another government called the culture of this world. A system built on lies, fabrications, half-truths, nice-sounding words that have no power, that have no life in them. It's like clouds without rainwater, okay? Okay? And the, and the majority of humanity is wrapped up in that reality. And we have been given delegated authority as envoys to go and tell them the beauty of what God has done through Christ. It's amazing. So back to verse 11. I just want to kind of work our way through this quickly. Because this is really sobering. And I think it's important for us to get this. Verse 11, it says, because we understand. Oh, I love this verse. He got it. And some other people that were running with him got it as well. Because he doesn't say, because I understand. He used the word we. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord. We work to persuade others. God knows we're sincere, and I hope you know this too. We're commending ourselves to you again. No, we are giving you a now. No, we are giving you a reason to be proud of us. So you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere. This is where, like you know, like some years ago, um, right before COVID, which I'm still waiting for somebody to say, "Just kidding." Okay, still waiting, <laughs> still waiting for that. But God said, "I'm I'm taking everything back to the basics." We're going to just skinny this thing down and get back to what really matters again. All the fluff, all the hype, whatever. He's, he's getting back to this sincere place um, where he wants the body again. And he says, hey, this may not make total sense to you. It's all good. But in the end, it's, it's for your benefit. Verse 13, he says that. Like, you may think we're crazy, but... At the end of the day, we're trying to bring glory to God, and somehow we're trying to benefit your life through this. That's really what we're up to. That, that by the grace of God, is our heart here at Harbor, by the way. But then he transitions into his primary point, which is to establish a proper mindset. Everybody say mindset. Which requires a mind shift. To get proper mindset, you've got to shift the way you think. Okay? And so he lays this out in verse 14. He says, either way, there's one thing that controls us. If you're going to be controlled by anything, let it be the love of God. Let God's love totally overtake you and who you are and be controlled by his agape power that's working within you. That is the most beautiful thing that could ever happen in any of our lives. And then he starts to go into the gospel and just lay this thing out like precept upon precept. And he says, since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe 
that all have died to their old life. This is profound because he's given them perspective for what's possible in any person living on the planet right now. You know, there's some, been some really destructing theology over the years. Did you know that? There was, there's, a, there's been a theology that said there was actually people that have been created for God's wrath. Now, there's a deep, deeper topic to that, which we're not going to go into tonight. If you have any questions about that, you can email Juan Albin at Juan.Albin at HarborSouthFlorida.org. But I think Paul is clear that when Christ gave his final breath on the cross, he did that for every single person, past, present, and future. He gave his life for all of humanity. And there's this mystery that in his heart, he died for all of us so that we could all have the potential to have new life. And there's a world that is out there just waiting to hear this news. But we're silent. Because we don't understand our responsibility of being delegated authorities in the earth as envoys on behalf of his kingdom to go and confront the culture of this world that's that's drowning out people's belief systems by lies and systems of lies. What's the primary fruit? I just want to show you this quickly of those who are living in this kind of mind shift. Look what he says in verse 16. This is really powerful. Because when we're talking about Loving other people, you got to catch this because if you don't, you're going to be off kilter a little bit. He says, this is the fruit. We've stopped evaluating one another or others through a human point of view. The problem in the world is not the people that are out there that don't understand this message. It's the church. That is, is in the way that they're evaluating people. Human point of view. In fact, he tries to illustrate this, say, man, we thought we, thought we were, you know, evaluating Jesus merely through a human point of view. And wow, there were some moments when he kind of un- unveiled himself, and we fell at our feet, our feet as dead men in front of this guy. He was way more profound than we even understood. How differently... I mean, if you think about John who wrote the book of Revelation, I mean, he, you know, he thought he knew Jesus until he's taken up and then he sees this one and then he, like, he doesn't even know what to He probably felt like he was going to explode into a million pieces. There's aspects of this thing that we don't understand. And agape love of God is going to change the way we view everything. And it's going to begin to give us a different posture as we walk as envoys in the earth around people that are very broken, or as we would see them as such. But, you know, Zacchaeus was changed in one moment. In one moment. Came down on the tree, Jesus went to his house, he, he, you know, gave back everything that he had stolen, and then turned over, what was it, like four times of his wealth to, to, to give away to other people. Like, in one moment! The possibility, verse 17, just dream with me, please. It says, this means that if anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, the old is gone, a new life has begun. Crucified, dead, buried, risen, seated. In fact, if you look, this, is, this will be a mind-blowing thing to you. It says that we were crucified with Christ. We were buried with him. We were resurrected and we were seated. What? How did that happen 2,000 years ago? We weren't even born yet. It's a crazy thought. But there's resonant destiny on the inside of every single person created in the image of God. You know, the adversary, the way he hurts the father because he hates them, is by hurting his kids. Right? As a parent, you know, like, man, it's one thing to have something bad happen to you, but when something happens to your kids, it's like, I'm from Montana. Grizzly bears are mean, okay, right? But there's nothing worse than a mama grizzly bear with cubs. You get around her, a moose, the same way, same, same story. 
it's like wild. But, I mean, you just don't want to mess with any mama bear or mama moose <laughs> with littles, right? Because there's so much love. Verse 18, he says, all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. Can I give you your assignment tonight? As, actually, Nathan, as you come back up, bro, that would be awesome. He says, God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. To reconcile means to be bought back. Simply all they need to hear is this has happened in Jesus. This is what's taken place. Who's going to be the envoy that's going to go tell them? Reversing, I'm established in your beauty. I have gazed upon you. I see who you, who you actually really are. I've entered into a state of worship with the way that I live my life. Not just on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning. But every moment of the day. And I walk and I overflow. Beauty and healing and freedom protection to other people and they sense it because I'm authentic. I could brag on my wife big time and I love our partnership and the way that we we work together in so many ways. But we're we're fleshing this out practically because her is a physical therapist in her clinic. This is what she does. She carries the kingdom of heaven as an envoy into that space. She tells me like I was like how was work today and she's like oh, it was awesome like People just start opening up their hearts. In fact, they're sad when the therapy ends. <laughs> Can you imagine? They're sad not having to be able to go to her anymore. Because they're like, I feel peace when I'm with you. I feel hope. I feel joy. That's an envoy. And as Holy Spirit leads her, she shares. As God would have her to share about the beauty of who they are. In Jesus. Look at this in verse 19. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. So now he inserts this into us. Now he's in us, reconciling the world to himself. Not holding people's missing of the mark against them. Can I just, just this is important to drill down here for just a minute because we get so offended at people's actions. But, and it's not awesome, right? Like, but that's symptomatic of a deeper thing that's going on in the inside. Well, that person drinks or does this or does that or fill in the blank, right? When we're standing in a moment like that with somebody, I don't know how to explain this. Like, for me, I actually like connecting and getting around people that are, that are maybe the world would think is, like, completely hopeless because I just want to see God's power put on display through their life. Do we want all the shiny people around us? Like, just everything kind of, you know, I've been in those worlds where you... you you come to, to some church gathering, and you, how you doing? Oh, awesome, great. And what I found is that it's not awesome and it's not great. We don't have any authenticity there. There's no vulnerability. There's no transparency because there's no authenticity. And God is wanting us to connect with each other, engage with each other, press through the issues, and somehow be able to see each other through the lens of the eyes of the Father. This wonderful message. Just, just for a second, could we just close our eyes? I want, I want you to think about this. If you could be entrusted with the most precious thing ever entrusted to anybody in human history, it's this, the message of reconciliation.
We pray into this, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you bring an awakening in us tonight? Would you bring an awakening into our region? Would you bring an awakening into our nation? Would you begin to move around the nations of the earth? We're asking for an outpouring of response to a reckless reconciliation moment that happened 2,000 years ago, would you begin to do something way bigger than ourselves through us? Everybody look up here real quick as we, we conclude. I didn't even know about this. My dad actually, um, he, he, he just like, I, gotta, I had to call you. I had to ask you about this. I was like, what, dad? He said, did you see the baptism thing that was taking place? Actually, he thought it was here. It was in Clearwater, Florida. Some people were having a baptism at the beach. They thought maybe a couple people were going to get baptized. All of a sudden, there was a younger generation that was around watching this. Something happened in their hearts by seeing this visible representation of death to the old self, resurrection into newness of life happening on the beach. And they just started coming and saying, can we get baptized as well? And it was on the news, evidently. And what was going to be a handful of people turned into hundreds of people walking this thing out. That's what we're getting ready to see. All you got to do is put yourself out there. Take heart. Be courageous. Be it a place of rest. Know who you are and whose you are and what authority that you carry. We just sing just something, Nathan, just, just before we go tonight, just, just to kind of reflect on the beauty of the Son of Man and what has been given to our hearts. Let's just take just a minute as we sit and reflect. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder, and show me who you are, and fill me with your heart, and lead me in your love to those around me. prayer in our seats tonight before we leave and the prayer would be this God show me your heart give me fresh perspective on your heart for those living in this world Lord and the anointing and the authority that you've given us in this room those listening to this message later those watching online that is the hope of glory for the entire world that is the gift of God has been given to humanity through Christ that we will see freedom come that we will see people's lives that were being destroyed preserved that we will see peace come where there's been restlessness and fear God, we will see breakthrough into brokenness. 
where wholeness is manifest. That destiny and purpose and calling will be wrought in people's lives instead of destruction. Lord, we're asking for you to do something through the hearts of a generation. Would you stir us here tonight? Would you come as you've planted the seed of your kingdom in our heart, which is like leaven that cannot be stopped. Once it gets in, it, it, it takes up every space and corner and crevice of our lives this agape love of God. May it control us. May it move us to those around us. We love you. And we worship you. In Jesus' name. Peace and God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.
So be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. So be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. So be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. 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 Worthy is your name. 